Before we read the scripture, Song of Songs, chapter 3, verse 1, I need to just say that the phrase, all night long, as we have here, was first in the Bible, and it was not Lionel Richie, okay? Just thought I'd, uh, <laughs> though, uh, that's another song from the 80s there. But uh, that phrase comes from scripture, and we just reminded, this is a great love song. And so we've been kind of telling the great love song in our series. This is the third uh, of our series. We're moving up to Easter, looking forward to what God is going to do through the retelling of the wonderful Jesus story. But let's re read together, shall we? All night long on my bed, I looked for the one that my heart loves. I looked for him, but did not find him. I'll get up now and go about the city through its streets and its squares. I will search for the one that my heart loves. So I looked for him, but did not find him. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. Have you seen the one my heart loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found the one my heart loves. I held him and would not let go of him till I brought him into my mother's house to the room of the one who conceived me. And all God's people said, amen. You know, when we uh, thought about some of the songs that have been sung out there about love, there's, there's quite a large body of material that tells us how difficult romance is. When it's going great, it's great, but when it's not going so well, it can be very painful. How many of you remember the song by Nazareth years ago called Love Hurts? We still hear it on the radio. Yeah, quite a few know. This is what the lyric actually is. Love hurts, love scars, love wounds. They were like a really heavy rock band with big hair and everything. Love hurts, love scars, love wounds, and mars any heart not tough or strong enough to take a lot of pain, take a lot of pain. Some fools think of happiness, blissful togetherness. Some fools fool themselves, I guess. They're not fooling me. It's kind of quite depressing, isn't it? Really depressing song about love hurting. And today's title is You've Lost That Loving Feeling. Who, who likes the Elvis version? Everyone, can you, who likes the Elvis version? A few, okay. Uh, who liked the, uh, uh, who did the other one? Uh, Tom, Tom Cruise in Top Gun. Who likes the Tom Cruise in Top Gun version there? And who remembers the original one in 1964 by the Righteous Brothers? Can I see those? That, oh, this is very popular. Yeah, yeah. We're telling our era right now. You remember how it goes? You never close your eyes anymore when I kiss your lips. And there's no tenderness like before in your fingertips. You're trying hard not to show it, baby. <laughs> but baby, baby, I know it. And the, next, the rest is, you've lost that loving feeling. Ooh, that loving feeling. You lost that loving feeling, and it's gone, gone, gone. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, we're good. Come on, we're really good. That's awesome. That's good. And actually, the song then goes, bring back that loving feeling. It's like you can lose it. So I like the optimism of that song by the Righteous Brothers, bring back that loving feeling. It's gone now, but I believe we can bring it back. And we're going to talk about what happens when a relationship goes sour, what happens when a relationship weakens or even goes very badly wrong. Well, you know, C.S. Lewis said famously, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one. Wrap it carefully round the hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable, but to love is to be vulnerable. And I thank God that Jesus Christ, though he lived in perfection in heaven, Jesus Christ came to this earth with all its sorrow and horror and pain, and he determined that he would love in his obedience to the Father. And Jesus Christ made himself, he made himself so vulnerable as a babe in a manger, then hanging on the cross to die for us for sin. That is love, the greatest act of love that's ever been expressed. And if you're thankful that Jesus died for me and for you, would you give him praise now, everyone, and thank him? 
And so this message does have a kind of warning. Three times repeated in this song is the, is the phrase, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. In other words, it seems like so Solomon is saying, the wisest man who ever lived is saying, you know, love can hurt. It can be painful. We're going to roll up our sleeves and think about how we can restore broken relationships. I think this helps us test as well whether we are in a right relationship or how we're conducting ourselves. But I want to encourage you to be a person of love. Uh, if you're not in a romantic relationship, the way that we express fellowship to one another is a very sweet thing. In fact, we've been arguing the case the last two weeks that the highest form of human love is actually fellowship as we walk in the light as he is in the light. So how do we rebuild a relationship? Well, first of all, we need to figure out what may be wrong in the relationship, and sometimes we don't even, need, don't even realize that something is wrong until the Holy Spirit prompts us and reveals something in our own, own lives. So let's look down verse 1. All night long on my bed I looked for the one that my heart loves. Though the relationship is weakened, there's a determination to work on this relationship. And I want to say this, by the way, every relationship goes through tests. Every working relationship is going to be tested. Every relationship with our neighbor, there's going to be a test. And especially when it comes to marriage and relationship with our children or grandchildren, there are tests. And I just want to encourage you that if you have problems in relationships, that's quite normal. It's normal to have problems in marriage. We had a sweet uh, wedding blessing shower with Sarah and Kyle came around to our house on Friday night with a wonderful time being able to pray for them and bless them. And we, we gave that little exhortation, there will be troubles, there will be challenges. And at that point, don't let the devil tell you we should never have got married. Once you're married, you're in the right relationship. And God encourages us to work on that relationship. Well, will you just say the word normal? No, it's normal to have problems. It's normal to have difficulties. And so we see here this woman has lost her loved one. She's, she's clearly already uh, pretty wrapped up with this relationship. The relationship is functioning well, but there's a short season in this song when there's a distance between the man and the woman. Now, it may well be, if we read later verses, that Solomon, or the man, was actually at war. And the big movie of the year, American Sniper, it may be that the message of that, of that movie is the hardest battle is not, though it's very hard to be on the, in the battlefront, the hardest battle is sometimes returning home and dealing with all the emotions that come with that. So this was a military man in Song of Songs, so she may well have been like a, a military wife, struggling because she's not being able to find her loved one. Now, I want to say this right, right away, that there are right relationships and wrong relationships. We're going to work this morning, especially on how we rebuild right relationships. But I think it's appropriate me for just to mention that there are wrong relationships in this world. Leviticus chapter 18. It sounds like a great conversation starter, but I've been reading through Leviticus recently. Isn't that a great conversation? Have you read Leviticus lately? Well, yeah, I've been reading through Leviticus. And chapter 18 and 19 are very important uh, chapters in Scripture because the Lord keeps saying in the middle of this word to his people, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. It's like the most repeated phrase uh, in the book of Leviticus. I am the Lord. The Lord keeps giving this emphasis that God is speaking. And there seems to be a trend for many modern Christians to think that the Old Testament is done and it's only the New Testament. But let me tell you, you can't understand the New Testament properly without the Old Testament. And you can't understand the new without the old, nor the old without the new. And so we believe that all of Scripture is God's Word to us today. So please don't let anyone say, well, oh, th th those rules, those commands that God gave, it's all cultural. So we can abolish it. Listen to me. Jesus said, I've not come to abolish it. So if you think that you are greater than Jesus, by all means, abolish the Old Testament commandments. But we, we believe it's the word of God. Jesus said, I came to fulfill it. In other words, he came to put the law of God in our hearts and minds. And I thank God that when we break the law, because we do break the law of God, I thank God for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross, yes, to put his law in my hearts and mind. But when I fall short, I thank God that he washes me clean and forgives me. What a gracious God he is. In fact, can we thank him for his grace right now? What a wonderful Savior. Nonetheless, we need to know what the law of God is. 
And of course, Ezra read the entire book of the law, including Leviticus, to all God's people, everyone who could understand. And the law of God makes it clear that there are some relationships that are very simply wrong. There is such a thing as a wrong relationship. And I need to counsel you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're a man or woman of God, and you're in a wrong relationship, you need to get out of that wrong relationship as quickly as you can. Now, if you're married to that person, you need to work on that relationship as much as you can. But any wrong relationship needs to be ended in the name of Jesus. We just want to declare that. Now, God's job is to say what the law is. If I could say God's job, that sounds very trite. But in one sense, he, his role is to present the law before us. Our job is to keep the law of God. So if there's a wrong relationship, we need to repent of that. Everybody say amen. So the first thing I want to say is a wrong relationship must end. Everyone say that with me. A wrong relationship must end. Clearly, Song of Songs chapter 3 is not about a wrong relationship. This is a right relationship. But let me just park out a little bit longer on the wrong relationship. Can you remember the story of Joseph? And Joseph was doing a great job in his work. He was like the, the head uh, CEO of a large household uh, of a man by the name of Potiphar. Potiphar's wife starts hitting on Joseph. And Joseph made a decision that even though it would be costly for him, even though there would probably be consequences, when Potiphar's wife started flirting with Joseph, started saying, come to bed with me, what did Joseph do? He got out of there as quickly as he could. Because he did not want to offend the Lord his God. He did not want to spoil any relationship. It was wisdom, but it was also the command of God that Joseph ran away from that wrong relationship. And I've just got a phrase here I want to use for us to all write down. If you have to keep it a secret, it's probably wrong. If you're keeping something as a secret, any secret liaison, any wrong relationship of any kind, it's not good for us. It's against the Word of God. A wrong relationship needs to end. And you may have come to the church today and you're saying, well, well, Pastor, I did a good job. I came to church in the rain. Did you notice? And I'm doing pretty well. I would say, absolutely, thank you for being here. But you can't be a disciple of Jesus Christ unless we also obey the Lord and do what He tells us to do. Let me tell you why this was the right relationship. They were male and female. Man and woman, that's very clear here in Scripture. They were in the same faith community. They were worshipers of the Lord. They were believers. In fact, not only did they believe in Scripture, but they were actually in Scripture. Which is pretty cool, isn't it? Who are you? Hey, uh, I was in the Bible. Um, They were in love. There was a natural desire going on. Friends and family affirm the relationship. You can read through that. There was an affirmation. And it's like the whole community blesses them. In fact, when it comes to a marriage, the reason why we gather people together, it's like it's a blessing on the whole community when a right relationship begins to flourish. We don't need more wrong relationships, but we need reconciled right relationships. So make sure that we get into a right relationship. If you're in one, hallelujah, we're going to talk about how we can work at that. But make sure that we always seek a right relationship. A.W. Tozer said, God is often the last to be consulted. Now, I might even counsel someone before you get married. Have you really thought about it? Have you prayed about it? Have you consulted the Lord God? Has there been a clear answer from on high? If not, do not proceed. Wait and check to see if it is the Lord. If it's a wrong relationship, then the sooner we get out of that relationship, the better. Everyone say amen. Oh, even a wrong relationship, it can feel so right. Like a drug, it can be so exciting, and we can sometimes lose focus on what we're doing. All night long on my bed, I look for the one my heart loves. Secondly, I want to say a right relationship needs help. I looked for him, but I couldn't find him. This right relationship is a good relationship, but they needed to help each other. They need, they need to work on this relationship. And so what can go wrong in a right relationship? Just ask me right now, what can go wrong, Pastor? Ask me, come on, ask me again. What can go wrong? We'll try and get some answers. But I want you to get out your pen and paper, get out your notebook, and we're going we're gonna to have a lot of stuff that I want you to write down. Is that okay? So I need you to get active, some active listening, because this is some homework that we all need to work on, because it's absolutely vital. So I want, please encourage me by showing that you're paying attention. You've got the Bible there. You've got your notebook. You know, Christian people, 
unless you're a genius, if we don't write it down, we generally don't remember much of it. So uh, I've got a lot of geniuses still looking at me without, the, without a notebook. Okay, my fellow genius, here we go. Okay, what can go wrong? You know, a right relationship needs help. Here's the first thing I want to suggest. When there's a loss of spiritual direction in your life, that will have an impact upon your relationships. If you've got a husband and wife spiritually directed, right with God, obedient to the Holy Spirit, reading his word, ashes cleaned out, hearts clean, relationships in a good state with others, you know, that's going to be awesome. And when that happens, what a great place it is we're in. But if we're in a loss of spiritual direction, let me tell you, friend, that will affect everything in your life. Secondly, selfishness. When we're selfish in our relationship, that's going to have a profound effect because suddenly we've moved from mutual service and mutual submission, mutual love, we've moved into a game of one-upmanship. Who does the most or who does the least? And bitterness can creep in. So if there's selfishness in my marriage, that's going to affect my marriage. By the way, the critic has stopped contributing. And when we stop contributing, we become a critic. That's very true in a marriage. If you've moved from a contributor to your marriage to a critic uh, to your spouse, then that's not a very healthy place to be either. Thirdly, when we stop abiding in Christ... Jesus said, remain in me, and I will remain in you. Well, when we stop remaining in Christ, when we're no longer abiding in Jesus Christ, that's going to have a pr profound impact on our relationship. John and Donna, I'm so grateful when in 2001, I think it was, you came to my former church, Holland Road Baptist Church, and you did a marriage conference. It was a brilliant marriage conference, and this is what I especially took from what you taught our people um, in that era. You basically gave a seminar on how to abide in Christ and walk in the Spirit. And I was waiting for all like the funny jokes, and, and there, was, there was humor, but I was waiting for like the really clever advice. But I think you gave us the very heart of what marriage was about. It's about walking with Jesus Christ, walking in the light, and that changes everything in the marital home. Give me an amen if you like that idea. Amen. Now, do you remember that story? Brilliant conference, thank you so much. Do you remember that story? when Jesus was at the temple and he was teaching the religious leaders and they were amazed at him. And then it was time for the family to, to walk back from Jerusalem all the way to their hometown in Nazareth. Do you remember what happened on the way? What happened? They lost Jesus, right? Mary and Joseph, and if you think that you're a bad parent, Mary and Joseph lost Jesus. I got a dear friend actually who left his daughter at a gas station and drove off and forgot about her, which is really awesome. I'm not going to even look, I, I'm, I'm just looking around so you won't have a clue who that is, but an uh, awesome story. Uh, all is good, uh, all is well, all is forgiven. But, uh, but uh, you know, Mary and Joseph lost Jesus. Now, what did Mary and Joseph do when they lost Jesus? Anyone remember? What did they do? They went back to Jerusalem. And I want to say, friend, if you lose Jesus, go back and find him. If I could put it that way. If, if our relationship is distant, well, he's not run from us. He's not run away from us, but we've run away from him. And so if in your marriage, Jesus is not at the center, that affects everything. Fourthly, distraction. You can write this down as well, distraction. This month I spoke to a Christian man, good man. I, I, I got the sense there's no gross sin going on in his life. But here's, here's the message that I think I got from this man. My life is centered around the activities of my kids. The kids are the center of my universe. And if I could take it a step further, I worship the kids. And I want to say, friends, if that's the case in our life, it's really bad for the children, and it's really bad for us. It's called idolatry. Jesus Christ must be the center of my universe, amen? Amen. Jesus Christ needs to be the center of God's people's life. We love our children. I got three of them. But let me tell you something. They grow up very fast, and one day you'll be walking them down this aisle and standing there and shedding a tear. And it just goes so quickly. And so I'm anticipating there will be some years in my life, unless the Lord returns, after my kids get married. You know, I'm hoping to live for a few years longer, if that's okay with you. <laughs> and... I, I, said, I think it's a really weak foundation to base our life on. The babies, the children, need to have their life 
on the rock of Jesus Christ. Jesus needs to be the center of my marriage. Jesus needs to be the center of my home. If I make the kids the center and everything is about entertaining them and keeping them happy, then they're not going to learn how to ever to wait for things, to be patient for things, how to work, uh, and how to, how to see a mother and father whose center is not one another, but whose center is Jesus Christ. And I was saying in our first message, you know, If this is my relationship with Louise, this is me and Louise, the closer we get to the Lord, the closer also we get to each other. It's not just about finding each other. It's about about finding one another in Christ. Marriage goes much better when Jesus Christ is the center. And let's not be distracted. Let's not allow good things to become more important than Jesus Christ himself. Can I have an amen on this one? I'm going to need some encouragement because I know this is God's word for us today. Next point. Loss of spiritual direction and distraction leads to uncommanded work. When we do something that God has not commanded us to do, when we want to do something rather than following the leading of the Lord himself, we get ourselves into even more problems. Next point, busyness. Busyness, we can crowd God out and we crowd each other out as well. A dear friend of mine, Michael Catt, pastor at Sherwood Baptist, his church is the church that made the movie Facing the Giants and Courageous and Fireproof. He's a great pastor. He loves revival themes. This is what he tweeted this week. Children used to attend church 24 hours a month. Now they attend 24 hours a year. Wake up, folks, he said. We are losing a generation. Friends, we've got a whole era of distraction and busyness and lots of good things and sweet things going on, but Jesus doesn't seem to be the center. God doesn't seem to be the most important one in our lives because I tell you what, we show it every day by the way that we invest our money, the way that we invest our time, the way that we invest our passion. If Jesus is not the center, oh, there's plenty of stuff to amuse us and entertain us, but those things are not going to endure into eternal life. Can I ask if, my guess is that most of us would be pretty confident that we're going to spend eternity with the Lord. But can I ask you, if you really do want to spend forever and ever with the Lord, don't you think it would be a good time to spend a bit of time with the Lord while we're on earth? And if we're going to worship together, and if we're God's mission people to transform the world, don't you think it would be an idea to put all the eggs in that basket rather than just put one egg in God's basket and share it around with everything else. Oh, there are good things. And yes, it can be our mission field, but show me that person who's come to Christ in that mission field. You say it's my ministry. Show me someone who's really following Jesus Christ because you're in that role. Make sure it is your mission field if, that, if God has called you to that mission field. Larry Wynn was a dear friend of Ike Reichard, one of our great former pastors, and I was able to have a bit of time with him uh, last week. He said, I'm the son of a church layman, and I learned more from my father as a layman that I learned from any other minister. He says, because there I learned about church and I learned about his good example. Perhaps that was the era when children were in church for 24 hours uh, a week, a month. Uh, but I, I thought that was an inspiring thing that he shared, that we can be a great example to our children. You know, I think sometimes there's a pressure in those 24 hours a year that the kids have. Can I just say this? This is a wonderful church but I don't think any church is good enough to be that brilliant in 24 hours for those 24 hours to to change their lives. I just don't think any church is that good, really. You can say, well, this church is that, this church is that. Hey, believe me, they're not that good. There needs to be a faithful commitment from God's people to prioritize being community with one another. There are so many distractions. I feel it, and I know that you feel it, And I think the best thing we could do in our relationship with God, our relationship with our spouse and our kids is say, God, I repent. I've misplaced my priorities. I'm coming back to this altar today, Lord. I want to be thrilled with you again. I want to be a worshiper. I want to be a participant. I want to be a contributor. I want to give my all to Jesus. If there's one theme I've had in my heart of late, it's I need to give everything that I have for Jesus Christ and for his kingdom cause. Next point, a critical spirit. If there's a critical spirit operating in your home, that will poison and sour 
about everything. If there's a critical spirit in your office, you know, it, it only takes one person in your office, and you know that critical spirit just infects everybody. It, that can be true in a Sunday school class or in a church. By the way, ministers know which parent has roast pastor or roast student pastor or roast Sunday school family group leader for dinner on the Sunday. Uh, if you've got any awareness of what's going on around you, leaders know that because I tell you what, the kids let you know. And we just made a decision a long time ago that we would try never to share bad stories about anyone in the church in front of our children. I notice that they're strong in the Lord. That's not the only reason. That's all God's grace. And always pray for the, the children, please of ministers. But I tell you what, the way that we speak about ministers and teachers, and yes, teachers at school, and student leaders and church members, we may be preventing our kids from hearing God's word. We reap what we sow. Next point, babies. Babies can sometimes get in the way of a relationship. That beautiful blessing that a child is. Let me say again, I got three myself. I love babies, and someday may the Lord bless me with grandbabies as well. In fact, can I see the grandparents right now? Look at you, you're such, a, you're such a happy bunch. And you know what, you're feeling a bit of pride there. It's like, yeah, yeah. And uh, can I just say, please stop bragging. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I, I can't wait to be there someday in God's time as well. Babies are such a blessing. But can I tell you something? If Jesus Christ is the center or your baby is the center, that will profoundly affect your marriage. Let Jesus Christ be the center. And that means that parents need to grow up, especially with our first child, and sometimes hand over our baby to a trusted worker in the church for a couple of hours so that we ourselves can worship together and grow in the faith. That's, that's a difficult thing. And everyone says, well, my child is, is different. They need to have their pacifier passed to them at exactly the right angle into their mouth. Otherwise, it'll all go wrong. You don't know my baby. It's like, just try and go through that. Because I tell you what, that will release you and that will strengthen your marriage. Your baby needs a good marriage. Amen. That's the, the foundation for each one here. Next point, sin. Any sin is going to affect our relationship, amen? Here's more, loss of intimacy. Finances, the, the biggest reason for, a, for finance causing divorce is concealed debt. And usually what happens is that when the person finally has to admit that there is some debt, here's what most people do. They don't tell the whole story. And I just want to say that, make, that makes it even worse. So if ever you have to, conf I'm whispering out, if ever you have to confess, confess it all. Because your spouse is going to have to go through a lot of pain. And when they get to a place of, okay, we're good, aren't we? They don't need to find out that there's some more. That's a very bad plan. Be honest. Anything that we conceal, we really need to confess. Can I have an amen for that? Amen. So many other things. I look at verse 6. Let's just read on. Who is this coming from the wilderness like a column of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and incense, made from all the spices of the merchant? I can almost hear military music in the background here. Look, it's Solomon's carriage, escorted by 60 warriors, the noblest of Israel, all of them wearing the sword, all experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side, prepared for the terrors of night. So verse 9 and verse 10 carries on in this theme. I want to suggest that sometimes the reason that our marriage marriage can, can struggle is because we're very busy conquering the world. And that's what happens here. There, there's a woman who's been running through Jerusalem. Have you seen him? Have you seen him? And suddenly he comes back. Yeah, I've got my sword. And Solomon's been conquering the world. And he, everyone says, great Solomon, you're a great leader. And you're a great king. And the woman's thinking, well, I don't know him anymore. There's nothing more painful than a leader who is admired in the community or admired in the world, but he's not admired in his home. And there's nothing worse than having great riches and all the trappings, but being poor when it comes to relationships with those around you. That's a painful thing to say, but I wonder if some of us have been so busy conquering the world, doing up the house, improving the yard, doing that project, and projects are good. God made us to be creative, but I tell you what, there are some relationships here that, that have been broken, and I believe God can put them back together. Amen. I want to encourage you. We've looked at a list of a whole number of things that can go wrong. But have you noticed a lot of those problems also have the solution in them? 
If we're spiritually distracted, we need to get spiritually focused. If we've been neglecting our relationship with God, then we need to prioritize our relationship with God. If we're in a wrong relationship with someone or something, we need to put that thing away and get back in the right relationship. So in the rest of the time that we've got left, how, how, can, we, how can we rebuild a broken relationship? How can we do that today? So again, pens and paper ready. We're going to give some answers here. Verse 2, I will get up now and go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? And if you forget everything else, I hope that you can leave today saying, I will search for the one that my heart loves. As husband and wife drive home together, Just remind yourself, this week, you know what? I'm going to search. And as Sarah and Kyle, who works on our staff at New Hope, as you prepare for marriage, keep searching for each other. Look for the one that your heart loves. Search for her. It's your duty in covenant relationship to seek after your loved one. Can I have an amen? It's like, Pastor, we love you talking about this subject, but I'm not sure I want to do anything about it. Well, let's search for the one that our heart loves. Don't search for a missing ingredient. Don't search for satisfaction. Don't search for your issue. Search for the one with persistence, with prayer, and with covenant patience. And then verse 3, the watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. Have you seen the heart, seen the, the one my heart loves? She shares a problem. I want to say secondly, ask for help. First of all, make sure you search for the one your heart loves, and that could be the Lord Jesus Christ. If you lose Jesus, go back and find him. It could be the relationship with your spouse or an alienated relationship from one of your children or even grandchildren, a friend. Search for them. Secondly, ask for help. But I want to say this about asking for help. Who do you think a Christian is supposed to ask for help from first? Did someone say the Lord? Thanks, Janae. Give it up for Janae. Correct answer. If there's a need to work on our relationship and we're beginning a search and we're saying something's not quite right, I need to work on this, ask for God's help first. Don't put it on Facebook. And don't say something subtle like, I've been having a really hard day, you know. That's kind of like gossip with yourself at the center of attention. Uh, It may get some attention, but I'll tell you what, it's very, very foolish. Very foolish to start putting it out there without putting it up there and saying, God, Help me, I need your help. Make sure that we pray and seek his face first, amen? Now, what happens if the relationship really does need some help and we've tried all we can and and we're stuck, things are not going very well? Um, I, I think we can ask for help for others, but I would encourage you, do it through the appropriate authorities. Do it through the spiritual authority that's already present in your life. And if you're not in spiritual authority, you need to get into a small group. You need to get connected to make sure that you're not isolated, just doing things your way rather than doing things in community together. So I'd say speak first to one of your leaders. And uh, if that doesn't work out too well and, and, and they're struggling, sometimes other help will be called in. But I thank God for the great maturity that exists in our Sunday school family group leaders. In fact, if you are one of those leaders, and if you're one of... You're in, you've got one bit of responsibility in our shapes model. If you're in that Sunday school family group, you're considered a leader. Will you just stand up? We just want to encourage you. Please stand if you're a leader like that with any age group, with children, students, grown-ups. I really want you to stand. I really, I'm saying that. Yes. Let's encourage them. Thank you. Come on. Keep standing. Keep standing. Keep encouraging. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So you've just seen someone that you can go and speak to if you want to get connected that way. So do seek help. Right, I want to just, I need to address affairs and adultery right now, okay? Just as we're passing by on this subject. Um, How to affair-proof your marriage. And frankly, this is a bit like a list that I feel I'm just supposed to share with us today, okay? Here's the first one. Don't do anything in secret. And actually, that, that just about covers everything. If you want to fair-proof your marriage, don't do anything in secret. If you need to keep it a secret, it's probably wrong. Secondly, don't carry a secret agenda in your heart that your spouse will never be able to match up to. Thirdly, be accountable online. Louise has got access to all my devices, all my passcodes. Um, if, If your spouse doesn't know your passcode, that's a bad plan. In fact, sometimes if we even need a passcode, that may be a problem as well. 
Fourthly, confess stray thoughts or danger spots or danger people. Now, in our former church, we were in the middle of a city center, and I just need to say, we had a much higher proportion of crazy people in the church. I mean, we're very blessed at, at New Hope. We've only got a few crazy people. Um, <laughs> my last church, we had loads of crazy people. And Louise always used, we used to have this little phrase. We would say, they're a DW. She's a DW. And that, that was a phrase for dangerous woman. Dangerous woman. And we just had to be very wise to that. We had to be wise when we had a, a stalker which wasn't very nice, and you just need great wisdom, how to handle that, you've got to protect yourself above all things. But uh, we keep s short accounts with each other, and if, if, there's, if, if we don't like a feeling about someone, we'll, we'll share that with each other, of course. I've also said at the same time, we're very careful to make sure that we honor God's people in our home. Next point, if you flirt with anyone that you're not married to, it's probably sin. Do you agree with me? Married people don't flirt with other married people. I just need to call that out in Jesus' name. If you think it's funny or it's cool, you've got a special relationship with that person, no, you don't. You've got a wrong relationship with that person. It's not cool. And married people need to know how to act in such a way that that person doesn't have access to be able to flirt with you. I think that's something that one can do. I, th I think it doesn't take much to do it, but you need to put yourself in a position, in a place where even if you're talking to someone that could be dangerous, you don't give them any opportunity in any way to flirt with you. Next point, how to affair proof your marriage, don't commit adultery. Just don't, don't do that. I mean, put all those other protections in, don't commit adultery. What happens if someone has committed adultery and you're married? The only way is repentance and forgiveness probably on both counts, repentance, forgiveness, can I suggest complete honesty, and never ever celebrate or delight in the sin that took place and said, oh, it was so special. It was... No, it wasn't. That was Satan's attack on your marriage, Satan's attack on your family. It came from the pit of hell, so you reject that relationship in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hate what is evil. That's not unspiritual to hate something. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. You cling to that marriage and you say, I actually hate what happened. You're not healed until you actually hate that it took place. Next point, zero tolerance of sin. You just can't go back to that. Zero, I just want to speak to them again. No, you don't need to do that again. Don't ever look back or romanticize something. Next point, build trustworthiness. The uh, the guilty party will sometimes say in a, in a relationship that's being restored, they don't trust me. I would want to say, friends, they will trust you, but they just need to see that you are trustworthy again, and that's going to take some time. That's counsel that we need. This is training for all our leaders as well when we come across people in this situation. It'll probably only take a few years for trust to return. Two or three years of sobriety will really help. So, and don't you ever say, they don't trust me, they don't trust me. Be trustworthy, amen? Next point, prayer. Soak it all in prayer. With God, all things are possible. Jesus Christ heals broken relationships, amen? I'm an incurable optimist when it comes to right relationships being restored. In the name of Jesus Christ, he is the healer, and he may even be healing a marriage today. Someone may be listening on the radio, but I believe that Jesus Christ is the healer. May I also say to the community, if someone is in pain, love always protects. And there should be no gossip in the community and certainly no pitchforks at any time. If there's a book I could recommend for someone who's caught in an affair, someone who's dealing with someone who's in a wrong relationship and you're desperate for them to end that, read the book Love Must Be Tough by James Dobson, a foundational text that will help you understand the psychology and more important, the spirituality of why it's so important to restore broken relationships. Let's move on. Scarcely, verse four, had I passed them when I found the one my heart loves I held him, and I would not let him grow. Can I say thirdly, as you've searched, and you've asked God for help, you've perhaps some, had some help from a few along the way as well, grab hold of your loved one, which I think means re-engage with your spouse emotionally. Reconnect with your spouse. This lady would not let him go. Can I say fourthly, don't give up. Better times will come. I remember reading that where a marriage is in trouble, a test was created where a marriage was in trouble and the couple determined to stay together, 
statistically, within five years, happiness levels go right up, but the most likely scenario was that that same couple who persevered through a tough time would end up very happy. Basically, most of those that saw it through, through five years later, were very happy after going through something like that. Now, the same test was applied to those that at a crucial point divorced. Those happiness levels were checked, and the average level of happiness was extremely low. You know what? I'm not surprised by that. Because there's something about persevering. There's something about investing in someone else. There's something about a shared history of healing and grace and forgiveness and mercy. That is a great, great blessing. I believe it's a lie when couples say, we, we, wanted to, we had to separate because we didn't want to let, let the children hear us arguing. All the statistics say that if you'd asked the children what they wanted, they wanted mum and dad to stay together. And I say it's a lie from the pit of hell again that says everyone will be better off if we weren't married anymore. There are some rare circumstances where occasionally counsel might be given that this relationship is over. But I think in the vast majority of our marriages, a high percentage failing in the United States of America, the best counsel we could ever get is the best chance of a great marriage you will ever have is the one that you already have. So can we just believe in perseverance and faithfulness? Can we give God praise for that perseverance? Amen. <laughs> Verse 5 at the end of our reading, till I brought him to my mother's house, Sorry, verse 4, the end of verse 4, the middle of verse 4, till I brought him to my mother's house, to the room of the one who conceived me. There's a little bit of culture going on here. Genesis 24, 67 is on the screen. Isaac brought his wife into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah. Sorry, Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah. So she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. I believe we need to say next and finally, to restore a broken marriage, we have to be giving in the bedroom. The physical relationship is very important. Now, normally when we get married in America, there's a legal declaration. Um, we know not of any lawful impediment. My eye so-and-so may not be married to so-and-so. It's like, legally, they're not married to anyone else. Okay, let's just check. These are two people that are known. They know each other. We've got some witnesses to declare that this is legal. But we don't just want a legal marriage. We want a spiritual marriage. We want to worship. We want to give glory to God. We want to gather the community together to witness and to celebrate and have joy. So that's the way that we generally do marriage in these days. And, and I would say, please try and include the Lord and God's people in that marriage and give glory and God to praise. And let it even be an opportunity when people can come to know about Jesus. Amen? But here, it seems that Isaac... And the Old Testament way of getting married was literally, he takes her into the tent. And it seems to me that in the Bible, sex is marriage and marriage is sex. They had less ceremony. It probably cost a lot less. They probably passed down grandma's and great grandma's dress and all the ladies wore their best frock and all the men changed their cravat from last time or whatever they had in those days. But in the Bible, sex is marriage, and marriage is sex. In a sense, there was no such thing as premarital sex in Israel, because when you had sex, you were married. Now, I still say don't have premarital sex, but there's a sense in which, biblically, if you do that, you just marry that person. And, and the Bible says don't commit adultery. So basically, the way that the vast majority of our nation is doing this is pretty disastrous. And we need to repent of that and get right with God and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, and wash me clean. But a husband and wife, the marital relationship begins in the bedroom. There's a lot more to life as well. Hey, I've learned how I am in the kitchen makes a difference as well. But I want to say, friends, the Word of God allows us to talk about this because God was not ashamed to make us this way. In fact, he said, that's good. Now, the reason why we get embarrassed is because sin came into the world. And so sometimes our awkwardness is because there's a lot of sin around us and there's guilt even in our own hearts through some of the things we've thought or done. Every one of us has sinned in some form in this area. But I suggest to you, friends, this is pure light. This is pure light. We don't, know if, we don't need 50 shades of gray, or like I called it the other day, 50 shades of Beelzebub. 
We need pure light. We need to walk in the light as he is in the light and we have fellowship with one another. You don't need help from the devil. Don't go to the devil for advice. Don't don't go to the world for advice. That'll just mess you up. Go to the word of God. Go to the Lord himself. Walk in the light and then concentrate on each other. Again, you don't need any worldly advice on this one. Just give 100% to each other. It's not the time to talk about the shopping. There are some of you, you've got to stop talking about the chores, stop talking about this or that, and focus on each other. It's a kind of mystical moment that God's verdict was good, and though sin came into the world, Jesus Christ is our redeemer, and so he can redeem the time, and he can redeem relationships. And if there's one thing I would love you to remember, as well as you know, searching for the one your heart loves, it's that Jesus Christ is the healer. Jesus Christ is the foundation. So finally, I want to say a right relationship is worth recapturing. It really is worth it. And verse 11, the last verse of our reading, we sense the joy. Solomon has come back and he's about to be reunited with the one who was searching for him. And there's great joy in that last verse, the last phrase, on the day of his wedding, the day his heart rejoiced. I pray that we can go home rejoicing today because there is hope. You can have more than an average marriage. You can have a magnificent marriage, which does mean that there will be problems and there will be struggles. But I thank God because Jesus is the center. I can celebrate a 30-year wedding anniversary on August the 16th with Louise because of the goodness of Jesus Christ. God is so good. He's so kind. He brought us together. And what God has joined together, let no man separate. I'd love us to stand together right now, everyone.